in the Scriptures, Revelation, and we're going to look tonight at chapter 2 and verses 1 through 7. And here's what we're going to do. Revelation chapter 2, chapters 2 and 3, contains seven letters from Christ to different churches spread throughout Asia Minor, what we call modern-day Turkey. And I want us to look at those letters in our time together on Sunday nights throughout the next few weeks, taking one letter per evening together. And so tonight we will begin with the church at Ephesus, which is addressed in Revelation 2, verses 1 through 7. Let's read those together now. God's word says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. We'll end our reading there at verse 7. As I said, I want to come to each of these letters over the next several weeks on our time together in the evening and look at them one by one to hear what it is that Christ says to his churches. Now, since this is the first time doing this, I do want to show where these two chapters come in the flow of this book as a whole. won't do this each time we look at them, but it will be helpful tonight to consider how these chapters fit in Revelation as a whole. And Revelation is well known for being a book that has difficult areas to interpret and, and some puzzles to it, and all that's very well and true. But I, I do think that the main points of Revelation and its general flow, and even some of its details, can be known and appreciated by God's people. But let's just give kind of an overview very quickly of the book. In the first chapter, the glorified Christ appears to John. He's in exile on the island of Patmos, and on the Lord's day, suddenly Jesus himself appears to John. He gives him a prophetic revelation, a vision, whereby John sees the glorified Christ in Christ, as he appears to John in his glory, and there's lots of symbolism going on, but Jesus communicates to John a very clear message, and that is that Christ is in control of everything. Christ is in control of the churches. He holds them in his right hand. He walks among them. He's, he's in control of the rulers of the world. Christ is called the king of the rulers of the earth. And he's even in control of spiritual powers. He, he has the keys of death and Hades. Here's John suffering for the faith. He, he's a prisoner because of his testimony of Jesus. And Jesus appears to him to say, look, I am in control. Now skip over chapters 2 and 3. And in the rest of the book, Chapters 4 through 22, Christ shows how his control is working itself out in human history. John's a prisoner because of the testimony of Jesus, and very soon, and even presently, Christians themselves will suffer because of their faith. They'll be imprisoned. They'll be forced to decide, will they follow Christ and be cut off from food and other resources? Or, or will they follow the systems of this world? Will they take its mark and follow its ruler? Christ writes to the churches to assure them that throughout this cosmic battle, throughout this back and forth between Christ and Satan, Christ is the one who's in control throughout the whole thing. Christ is on his throne. Revelation is sometimes called the apocalypse, or its literature is called apocalyptic. And, and what that word means is it talks about peeling back the veil to see what's really going on. Think, think of the word, the, the book itself, Revelation, to, to show you something. To, to the earlier followers of Christ in the first century, suffering under the hands of Rome, things might have appeared to be out of control. 
Christ might not have appeared to be on his throne. The, the cause of Christ appeared to be in great trouble as Christians were dying for their faith. Well, in this book, Jesus comes and he peels back the curtain to say, here's what's really going on. There's a great cosmic battle between the beast and his followers, Satan, and between Christ and his followers. But through it all, Christ says, I am in control. I'm in control of my churches, in control of my universe, and I'm working out my redemptive purposes in such a way that nobody can thwart them. And that message, which is all throughout the scriptures, is given to us in this book because God wants to admonish his people to be faithful. He wants them to avoid any kind of compromise with the world system. He doesn't want them to succumb in any way to the pressure of the beast and his forces to deny or compromise Christ. So bring that back then to the two chapters we're going to look at. And what we see in these two chapters is how this conflict sometimes affects the churches. We live in this world and there's this conflict between good and evil. Well, well what is that conflict like in the life of the church? Chapters 2 and 3 are written to show us the call to faithfulness even within the church as we sojourn through this life. So chapters 2 and 3 then show us what our duty as Christians is when we face this conflict. There's seven letters, and each letter has seven features. And these are common to most of the letters, and I'll give them to you very quickly. This, this will be our outline, really, for every message in this short series. You have, number one, the church is always identified. So at the beginning of each letter, you will have this phrase, to the angel of the church in, and then the place is filled in. Seven different places, and each letter begins with an identification of the church. Then follows the description of Christ. You'll, you'll have some kind of description given of the Lord Jesus Christ. And each description, interestingly, is pulled from chapter 1. So if you go back and if you read chapter 1 sometime, you have this, this very detailed description of the risen Christ. Well, Christ is going to pull some of those details out as he addresses each church. And usually the details are significant for the situation that the church is facing. Three, you'll have commendation given to the church. In other words, Christ compliments the church. He says, here's something you're doing very well. And he, and he commends his church. This is in all of the letters except for one. One of the churches actually is not commended at all. And that is, do you know which church that is, by the way? The church at Laodicea. It's the very last one, church seven. No commendation given. So the church is identified, Christ is described, the church is commended, and fourthly, the church will be corrected. All right, so throughout these letters, Christ will say, you're doing this well, but you're not doing this well, and I want you to address that. Christ corrects the churches, but again, there are, once again, two exceptions, only one exception on the commendation, but two exceptions on the correction. Two churches are not corrected. There are two churches in these seven that are actually not corrected by Christ. He says, you're doing this well, and he encourages them to keep it up. Fifthly, Christ will admonish the church. In other words, he'll say, you need to correct this, and, and here's why, or, or if you don't, or well, it's not, not to the if you don't yet, but, but, but you need to correct this, and I charge you to correct it. Maybe that's the better way to put it. He, he corrects them and then charges them to get it in order, which then leads to the sixth place. Here's the consequences if you don't, all right? Here's what's going to happen if you don't heed my correction. And then seventhly and lastly, here's the reward if you do. So to each church, Christ identifies himself, addresses the church, commends them, corrects them if necessary, charges them to heed his warning, warns them what will happen if they don't, and offers them a reward for if they do. Now, just before we get to Ephesus, maybe you wonder, okay, so how does this, how does this speak to us? How does Robot Church fit into this uh, pattern here in Revelation 2 and 3? Well, there's something to be said for the number seven in the book of Revelation. Some books, numerology just doesn't work. It's not supposed to. Some books, numbers are significant, and Revelation is one of those. And all throughout the book, often the number seven signifies completion. 
You have the seven bowls and the seven trumpets and the seven seals showing the completeness of God's interaction with his creation. You have the seven spirits around the throne of God, and those are usually viewed as a reference to the Holy Spirit, the sevenfold spirit, the ideal spirit. Well, here are these seven churches. And though they were originally seven literal churches, these churches really did exist. Yet at the same time, they are representative of the church throughout the whole ages. Here are the strengths and the weaknesses. Here's the kinds of things that God's churches will face throughout their existence. So though it's seven churches, they represent all of the different Christian churches that have existed in redemptive history. Uh, It's not so much a panorama of time. Some view that as Ephesus is the early church and Laodicea is the latter days church. It's not so much that. These are the kinds of churches that exist. And here's the other reason this is significant for us. Every letter ends with this refrain. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, did you notice that? Whoever has ears, and that's singular, to the person who who will listen, he needs to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, Christ speaks to all the churches, plural, but he always brings his message home to every individual. In other words, what Christ says to Ephesus, though directed to them, he's speaking to all the churches. What Christ says to Laodicea, though he's addressing them particularly, is still a message for the other churches. And every person and every church has a responsibility to hear what Christ says. So let's consider then these churches, and let's begin tonight with Ephesus. In chapter 2, verse 1, we have the identification to the angel of the church in Ephesus Right. Now, where is Ephesus? We don't have to do a big geography lesson here, but Ephesus is located in what we call today Turkey. It was Asia Minor in the ancient world, but it's modern day Turkey. All of these churches are located in modern day Turkey. But back in the day, in John's day, this was one of the four most powerful cities in the Roman Empire. So this was a big deal city when John lived. This would be like somebody addressing New York, or Philadelphia, or Washington, D.C., if they were speaking to the United States. One of the four most powerful cities in the ancient Roman Empire with a population of more than a quarter of a million people. So 250,000 people lived in Ephesus. And it was center of commerce. It's a trade, major stop on the trade routes there in Western Asia Minor, and it also featured the Temple of Artemis, or called Diana by the Romans, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So again, this was a, this was a major city, well known. Uh, Diana's temple is actually four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens, and you've probably seen pictures of the Parthenon. That's a well-known temple. Well, this one was four times bigger, and it was made entirely of marble, had thousands of priests and priestesses. Many of these were were involved in the worship there. Also, by the way, in the ancient world, temples were your banks. None of you store your money at church. But in the ancient world, you would have stored your money if you were wealthy in the temple because, hey, who would rob a temple? You're not going to bring down the wrath of the gods upon you. So here's a, a city with a massive temple. It's full of money. It's full of worship. It was a major center of the ancient world. And within this city is a church. Now, what is said to that church? Well, notice that the letter is addressed to the angel of the church. And there's two ways to look at who this angel is. Some take it just to be the pastor of the church. And the word angel can also be translated messenger. So sometimes it's just read as being directed to the church's messenger or the church's pastor. But others view it as a literal angel. And I think that's probably right. I'm not going towards a doctrine of guardian angels or or anything like that. But when you read the book of Revelation, you see all this interplay between life as we know it and the spiritual world. Our eyes are being opened to realize that there's more going on than just us looking at each other with pews in a building. What we do at church interplays 
with the spiritual world. There, there's more to life than what we can see. Other books of the Bible talk about this. 1 Corinthians 11, the passage on head coverings, however you read that, nonetheless talks about it important because of the angels. The angels observe worship in the Christian church, and they're learning about what God is doing through his redeemed people by us, which is an amazing thought. So I think this is actually directed to the angel and thus communicated by the angel to the church. Now, what is the description of Christ that is given? Well, we read here in verse 1, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. A few things to take from this description. You have that language, these are the words of him. And that just looks like normal language to us, but that's actually Old Testament language that God himself would use when speaking to his prophets. They would say, thus says the Lord, or this is what the Lord says. Well, here is Jesus himself saying, these are the words of him. So in other words, Jesus is standing here and speaking to us as God. He's not just you know, a lesser God, or he's not just some kind of exalted spiritual being. God himself, the Yahweh of the Old Testament, is speaking to us in Christ. And Christ says, I am the one who holds the seven stars in my right hand. You probably have right in front of you verse 20 of chapter 1. Let me read that verse real quick. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So what is Christ saying here? Christ is saying, I am the one who has the seven stars in my hand. In other words, all the angels of the churches, I hold them in my hand. I have a firm grasp on them, Christ says. And I am the one who also walks among the seven golden lampstands, and those are the seven churches. So Christ is saying, I have the angels in my hand. I've got them in control. And I'm walking amongst the churches. I know what takes place in my churches. And as God who knows and controls, I speak now to my church. So what does he say to this church? Well, we have the third thing in verses 2 and 3 where Christ commends the church. Look again at verse 2. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Here's the main thing that Christ commends this church for. They are really good at sniffing out false teaching. In fact, verse 2 funnels down to that. He says, I know your deeds, that is. Here's the deeds that I know. I know your hard work and your perseverance, and here's where you've hard, here's where you've worked hard and persevered. You cannot tolerate wicked people. You have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not. This church was really good at sniffing out false teachers. Now, who are these false teachers? Jesus says they claim to be apostles, but they are not. Maybe you're thinking there of the 12 apostles, the 12 original disciples of Jesus, take out Judas and put in Paul. Is that who Jesus is here talking about? He's probably not talking about the original 12 apostles, apostles with a capital A. There's actually a wider circle of apostles, and the scriptures refer to these people in a few different places. They were representatives who traveled from church to church, and they had authority from their sending church. All right, we're Presbyterians. We believe that churches interact and are, and are interlocking with one another. There's evidence for that in the New Testament and the early church. There, there'd be authorized representatives who could go out from one church and go to another church and, and bring them a message, bring them the word from the Lord, preach God's word to them. Well, before Paul left Ephesus, You read in the book of Acts, before he left Ephesus, when he founded that church, he spent three years with them. And when it came time to leave, he warned them with tears that one day savage wolves would come among their congregation. 
We read in 1 Timothy that when Paul left a particular area, he, he wanted Timothy to stay in Ephesus so that Timothy could commend certain people, or sorry, command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. So here's Paul warning the church at Ephesus. Look, one day savage wolves are going to come. They're going to they're spread false teaching among you. It gets to the point where Paul says, Timothy, you have to go now to Ephesus, and you have to command certain people to no longer teach false doctrine. The day Paul warned about had come, and he sent Timothy to help strengthen their resistance against false teachers. Well, by the time we come now to Revelation, which is the last book in the New Testament. So this is after the time of Paul and Timothy. It looks like they've done that very well. Timothy has been successful in teaching the church. Here's what we believe. Here's what we practice. And we resist false teaching. And now Jesus commends them for their resistance to false teaching. We're not told exactly what it is the false teachers were teaching. You you could try to deduce that from reading the book of First Timothy. If you look just for a minute at verse 6, Jesus refers to the Nicolaitans. He says, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Maybe there Jesus is saying the Nicolaitans is, is the false teaching you're resisting. But the only problem there is that we're not, not 100% sure what those people taught. We, we get some details later, but the full picture isn't there. The main point is this. The Ephesians resisted those who came in and tried to lead them astray with false teaching. It was probably some kind of teaching that cut at the gospel, some kind of practice that confused the message of the gospel. Whatever it was, Paul was, or excuse me, Jesus commends them for faithfully examining and sniffing out false teachers. Now, that's a difficult work. All right, it's hard to do that. It, it, you, there's the accusation of being unloving or, or not being fair. And this is something that Presbyterians have had to wrestle with throughout their history. In 1924, the PCUSA, which was the Presbyterian Church in the northern states at that time, the, the northern and southern church had not yet reunited. So the PCUSA in the northern states issued what was called the Auburn Affirmation. And here's what this affirmation said. It argued that while the church was committed confessionally to ideas such as Jesus' virgin birth, his atonement for sin, his resurrection from the dead, the reality of miracles, and the authority of the scriptures, at the same time, there were multiple theories for accounting for these ideas biblically. In other, way, in other words, well, we all agree with the confession when it says that miracles happened and Jesus was virgin born and he, and he rose from the dead. But you know what? That might mean different things. In other words, some might say, yes, Jesus rose from the dead and the dead man came back to life. Others may say, well, that, that, that took place spiritually. Jesus lives within my heart. Some would say, I believe that Jesus was virgin born. An actual virgin gave birth to the God man. Whereas others would say, well, I don't read that as an actual event in history I read it as something very different. And so the Auburn Affirmation was saying, look, we all believe in the confession, but you know what the confession means is really open for debate. Let's not insist on being too strict. And the reason they were saying that is because some conservative Christian ministers were insisting we have to hold to the traditional way of affirming these doctrines. If we say we believe in resurrection, we mean literal resurrection, we believe that the scriptures are inerrant, and we want to hold our ministers to this. Well, sadly, they lost that battle in the northern church. They eventually lost the battle in the southern church, too, and hence the PCA exists today because of our protest against that. Instead, the Auburn Affirmation was passed to say, Let, let's show our unity on this issue, that we can recognize ministers as ministers in good standing even they hold very different views on what it means that Christ rose from the dead. This affirmation was eventually signed by nearly 1,300 ministers and elders. And it was a sad denial of the gospel, and it was a sad capitulation to false teaching. It's hard to fight that fight. Jesus commands the church at Ephesus for doing it very well. Nonetheless, 
despite their success in maintaining right doctrine and right practice, they had slipped in one key area. Verse 4 says this, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Now that's hard language to hear. You, You hear in those words the Lord's displeasure. I hold this against you. And that kind of language, it implies consequences. If the situation doesn't change, there's going to be consequences. This church had left their first love or the love they had first. Now, what is that love? Or what love for what? What is it that they had left? Was it love for God, perhaps? Well, the book of Ephesians testifies to that. At the very end of Ephesians, Paul says this, Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. So in his letter to this church, Paul says, he gives a benediction on those who would love the Lord with an undying love. In other words, the Ephesians loved God, and Paul pronounces his blessing on them and says, May that love never die. May you always love God the way you do. And it could be, that in examining the false teachers, they got so focused on a creed that they forgot the object of the creed. Seems strange. Can, can, can you really love God's truth so much and, and yet not love God? Well, it is possible. There's such a thing as dead orthodoxy. There's such a thing as, as focusing on right truth, right practice so much that, that, that we do it almost independently of God. That can happen. So maybe it was love for God that they forsook. Maybe, though, it was love for one another. Paul says this in his letter to the Ephesians. He says, I've been praying for you ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. What is it that the Ephesians were known for? Two things. They had faith in Christ and they loved one another. This was a church that had a strong love for one another. Maybe they forsook the love that they had for one another. They, they were so focused on testing people and they were so focused on advancing the cause of Christ that their love for one another grew cold and, and, and their close examination for one another. Maybe, maybe they became suspicious of one another, always looking for some way in which somebody might be slipping because, hey, we've got to guard the church against wrong doctrine and wrong practice. And maybe they became imbalanced and their love for one another disintegrated as they focus so strongly on false teachers, or maybe, maybe it's just both. You remember when the young man asked Jesus in Matthew 22, what is the greatest commandment? What did Jesus say? The greatest commandment is you love God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second commandment is just like it. You love your neighbor as you love yourself. In Ephesians 4, Paul will say this to the Ephesians. He says, I want you to speak the truth in love. I want you to be focused on the truth, but I want you to speak it to one another in a loving way. As the ministers teach you God's truth, then the body will build itself up in love. I think very possibly it's just both. They were to love God, they were to love one another, and they were to exalt his truth. But in exalting truth, they lost sight of the God they loved, and sadly, their love for one another became very cold. Now, it's very sobering to think that God values our love for him and for one another as highly as he does doctrinal fidelity. It's very easy to think that Doctrine is the stuff God really cares about. We gotta get our preaching right, we gotta get our teaching right, we gotta get our creed right. And and then how we love him and how we love one another, well that's good, but but that's secondary. And according to Jesus here, they're they are on equal planes of importance. We we cannot have one without the other. So he offers this correction and he, he gives them this admonition. Look at verse five. He says, Remember or consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. He he wants to bring their minds back to what things used to look like. Remember, think, consider 
from how far you have fallen, their high spiritual status that they had as, as lovers of God and one another. They had fallen from that position. And, and, and John says, remember that and repent. Change your actions. Get back to showing the kind of love you did before. We're reminded maybe here of a 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says, I can have all these spiritual gifts, but if I don't exercise them with love, what doesn't matter? It doesn't benefit. Change your actions, Jesus says. Get back to loving me and one another like you once did. And notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, okay, you know, you, you can just relax the doctrinal standards a little bit. And if you relax the doctrinal standards, well, then love will just naturally come in. That's not how it works. It's not that we only have a certain amount of energy for doctrine and a, and a certain amount of energy for love, and we, we got to get the balance right. No, it's you love God's truth, and you love him and one another. He offers consequences. He says, if you don't listen, into verse 5, I will come to you. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, we won't look there tonight, but in Revelation 11, the two lampstands are described there as those who witness to the Lamb. The two golden lampstands preach the gospel and, and testify to Jesus' authority. The picture of the lampstand here is the picture of a witness, a church shining its light in the midst of a dark world. Jesus says, look, if you don't love one another like a church, if you don't love me like a church, then I'm not going to let you be a church anymore. If you don't use this responsibility, then you will lose your status as a church. He warns them that the church could disappear if it doesn't exercise proper love. But then finally, verse 7 He offers this reward. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here is the church's responsibility. They must hear and heed the message. And Jesus says, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And that tree of life there, you may recognize that from the book of Genesis, That's the tree that Adam and Eve said, God said, you have to leave this garden because now that you've disobeyed me, you you can no longer eat from the tree of life. They they were denied access to that tree because they were no longer worthy to eat from it because of their sinful position. Well, if you skip to the back of Revelation chapter 22, you'll read there of the new heavens and the new earth, and in the midst of them is the tree of life. Its leaves heal the nations, the nations which are saved and walk in the light of God's presence. What is God saying here? If you overcome this, if you repent and turn away, you'll enjoy the new heavens and the new earth. In other words, he warns them that they must persevere in their faith because if they don't, they will not enjoy their heavenly inheritance. I know our time's about God, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but but it's important to realize how John talks about salvation. Very often in the book of John and in John's Revelation, he looks at salvation the way you look at a parade if you were standing on the street. You're not looking at it as a whole. You're, you're looking at it as in progress. And very often John talks about salvation in that way. He, he, he puts a lot of emphasis on persevering in the faith and overcoming temptations to fall away. And and John's not doing that because he wants to say, well, some of you are 10% saved and some of you are 20% saved. Well, really spiritually among you, you're 50% saved. You're almost there. No, if we believe in Christ, we're saved all the way. And John offers assurance thereof. But at the same time, John emphasizes, we must always continue to bear fruit. We must persevere in the faith. And John's warning us here that, that if lack of love creeps in, then that could be a temptation that could lead to falling away from the faith. So when this correction is given, he says you heed this and you persevere into the one who conquers these temptations, to the one who perseveres, he'll enjoy the right to the tree of life. So let me conclude then with how this applies to you and me. As I read this passage and considered this passage, I had wanted to do this series for a little while and came to the church in Ephesus being first, and, and I was sobered and a little hesitant 
to preach the message. Because as I said this morning, and as I said, I think to you already a few times, we've been very encouraged and impressed by the love that this church shows for one another. This church has maintained a consistent witness about its gospel that's stated on our website. Some of you were around when this church made its way into the PCA. And yet at the same time, this is a church that shows a lot of love for one another, especially to new people like us. And and, and I think it's worth commending this church for the love you show. So I hope this doesn't come across in a way as as if uh, you're getting hammered for something that God has actually blessed us with. Here's something I think we can take away. Our church is characterized by love, and I thank the Lord for that. That's the work of His grace. You know what? That's worth more than a lot of other things that churches prize. Some churches today prize size, or they prize their assets, that they have money and they have programs and they have a certain number of people attending. You know what? If you have love for one another, that's better than all those things. That ranks much higher on God's list of priorities than anything else. I think we need to thank the Lord that he has worked in this body to make it a loving body. I think, though, we always have to be on our guard because this letter to Ephesus shows us that those things could slip. And I hope we'll be vigilant to maintain and be enthusiastic to continue that love, lest that ever change. We read here that, that Christ walks among the churches and, and he knows what goes on. He, he knows in our hearts whether we really love him or whether we really love one another. And, and, and he puts those things very high on the priority of spiritual effort. So make, may, may we be diligent to heed his call to love one another, to, 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 to fall away from those things and make, puts a church in danger where it could lose its identity. Let, let's be zealous for the scriptures and let's love the God of the scriptures and let's continue to cultivate love for one another. And as we persevere in our faith, God will be pleased to do that. Let's come now and sing our final hymn of the evening, hymn number 275. Take your hymn books. and 275, how firm a foundation. We'll just sing two stanzas from this final hymn tonight. Verses 1 and 2, 275. Stand with me, please. How firm a foundation.